On 20 August 2021, a TBM 700 crashed near Urbana, Ohio, following a steep descent and impacting after impact, and then impacted a road before disintegrating. What the heck? Airplanes don't fall out of the sky. Stick with me on Flywire as we look at the crash of this TBM 700. Hi, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to look at the crash of the TBM 700 Delta Tango just outside Urbana, Ohio, very close to Grimes Field, which is the airport for that uh, town. The airplane, a TBM 700, was bought by the pilot about nine days previously, and the pilot had completed about 15 and a half, reportedly, 15 and a half hours of dual training. And this flight was apparently his first solo in the airplane. The flight originated at Erie Ottawa Airport, Port Clinton, Ohio, and the destination was the Cincinnati Municipal Airport, easy for you to say, in Ohio. The flight proceeded normally on an IFR flight plan and the accident airplane climbed to 20,000 feet for the transit down to Cincinnati. There was no significant weather along the flight path. The center controller then directed a descent from flight level 200 of 20,000 feet to 12,000, possibly 11, it's a little unclear. The flight then changed from, to Columbus Approach Control and was assigned 10,000 feet. The approach controller noted a left turn as the airplane descended through 12,100 and inquired the pilot. Multiple attempts to contact, contact the pilot ensued, but no further communication occurred. Approach, uh, good afternoon, 700 Delta Tango, with you to send me 1,000. 700 Delta Tango, Columbus Approach, good afternoon, sir. The date now, altimeter is 3. Going to maintain 10,000. Thousand seven hundred Delta Tango. You understand the direct Lunkin, uh, but there's a disclaimer. Thousand feet, yes, sir. Clear direct Lunkin, but there's a couple of parachute zones up uh, near Midtown Airport and Waynesville Airport. If you're familiar, I have to back you around those. Just want you direct. Direct Lunkin at ten thousand feet, and we'll listen to you. Thanks, seven hundred Delta Tango. You. So Columbus approach. You guys all right? Thank you, Columbus approach. 700 Delta Tango, this is Columbus Approach, if you can hear me, acknowledge. 700 Delta Tango, Columbus Approach. And 700 Delta Tango, Columbus Approach. A witness about two miles south of the accident location observed the airplane at high altitude in a nosedive descent toward the ground. Pretty much his words. He reported the airplane was not turning or spinning. It was headed straight down. Further, he observed no signs of distress, no smoke or fire, or parts coming off the airplane. He thought the engine was at full throttle. It's kind of hard to tell. He did not witness the impact as the airplane descended behind some trees from his line of sight. The FAA NTSB field agents noted that the airplane impacted trees, two power lines, and the terrain first in a left wing low attitude. The initial ground scar located in a residential yard, contained separated components of that left wing. The airplane then crossed a highway, struck trees and a ditch, continuing into a mature potato and soybean field, farmer's field, and the airplane wreckage was scattered along a distance of 2,050 feet along a 275 magnetic degree track. Speed was likely greater than 300 knots. The ADSB data uh, available on normal internet sites terminate with the airplane heading roughly south at 12,100 feet. This is very nearly worthless in determining what happened in the final moments of the flight. Let me do a side note about how ADSB works. ADSB out is mandated in airplanes that fly in certain airspace, and the FAA retains one second data for every single one of those flights. Certainly flight in the flight levels count as that category, and the accident airplane had ADSB out installed. The vast majority of ADSB receivers are ground-based and subsequently most airplanes have the ADSB antenna located on the bottom of the airplane. If your airplane does do a lot, if the airplane does do a lot of open water international flying where satellites monitor the ADSB transmissions, a top mounted antenna is required. Diversity, I think is what they call it. For most G airplanes, a bottom mounted antenna is sufficient. The ADSB box has to have a WAS out, has to have WAS GPS in it so it can then send the signal containing its GPS position accurately, as well as pressure, altitude, and all that. 
and that locates the airplane in a very precise manner and the air traffic control integrates that information into traffic displays and then, as I said, records every second of data, keeps it. The kicker is the GPS signal is satellite based and has a very weak signal, so the antennas for the GPS are located on the top of the airplane. Normally this is not a problem. Most folks have a tendency to keep the top of the airplane oriented up. This keeps the antennas pointed in the right direction. I know this in the failure mode because I go upside down often in my aerobatic bonanza and have become familiar with the data dropouts, what they look like. Generally speaking, the only thing that can make an airplane fall out of the sky is a loss of control precipitated by a flight control departure, a critical separate, a part separating from the airplane, an upset of some kind or a pilot induced unusual attitude, which I guess is an upset as well. The witness statement gives us some key information. He reported that the airplane was in a steep, steep dive, not spinning or turning. Nothing falling off and the engine making high power. For the moment, this rules out a loss of control in flight due to a flight control discontinuity or a major component failure or departure of the airplane. This leaves us with an upset of some kind. Okay, another interesting thing about ADSB is that the government is not the only entity that collects ADSB data. Although FlightAware, people like FlightAware and FlightRadar24 only display government ADSB data on their websites, unless of course you're willing to pay big bucks, particularly to FlightAware, to access what is known as inlet data. Um, that's it's kind of interesting. So <laughs> there are enthusiasts out there that track virtually everything. And for example, in England, the Reggie spotters log train data. Some Reggie spotters uh, they log aircraft tail numbers and such in detail. When I was stationed at RAF Lakenheath in the UK, I was very concerned about the operational security aspects of all these enthusiasts, who we don't know who they are, logging movement data for Air Force airplanes. Pretty hard to stop. Glad the English are on our side. I hope they stay that way. These days there are, no, there are ADSB enthusiasts, and all you need is a Raspberry Pi computer and some software and an antenna and then you can combine your data with that of thousands of other enthusiasts and keep tabs on everything airborne or come very close to it, no matter if you tell the FAA you want to be secret. I've started checking on these sites when I see dropouts in the ADSB data that I'm trying to use on FlightAware. When I go upside down in Charlie, my aerobatic, my aerobatic bonanza, I notice two things. Quite often the GPS antenna will lose its view of the sky long enough and the GPS will stop working for a while. That kills the ADSB. I also noticed that the ADSB drops out usually faster than the GPS because the antenna is no longer pointed at the ground. These dropouts can show in a few different forms. Most internet websites will continue to compute the track of the airplane toward its file destination, extrapolating the flight path, but that's not real. What is real is how frustrating that is to me. <laughs> And, but also what is real in the inlet data often shows the dropouts in a conjunction to additional ADSB heads not retaining the government database. For 700 Delta Tango, I noticed the same ADSB dropout pattern that I've seen from my own aerobatic flights in my F-33C. For 700 Delta Tango, we see dropouts and then two additional hits not seen on the other public data files. After that hit at 12,100 with a decent rate of 1,300 feet per minute heading 180, there are two more hits, one at 10,925 feet, heading 154 degrees, with a decent rate of 11,712 feet per minute, and the last one at 9150, heading 154 degrees, with a decent rate of 23,104 feet per minute. That's screaming. This is significant, and this is probably the point at which the witness first observed the accident airplane. I think the evidence is pointing to an upset leading to this it is a loss of control, but it's more of a control flight into terrain um, <laughs> that on the end. It's important to note that this wreckage was along a 275 degree track and the left wing touched down, touched the ground first, followed by the rest of the airplane, then it disintegrated energy. Um, what it says to me is that the pilot was trying to regain control of the airplane. He was just too late. There had to be some rolling happening during the descent because the last ADSB I've seen had the airplane on a 154 degree heading at 303 knots at 8,500 feet above the ground. That takes roughly 22 seconds to hit the ground from that point at that speed. In that time, the airplane probably, it did turn 121 degrees to the right, 
then establish a left bank or probably 10, de uh, probably 10 degrees or more just prior to the impact. What kind of upset was experienced to result in that situation? You know, I don't have the answer. And we won't see one from the NTSB for another two years, if ever. But I think I, I can tell you what I think. I don't think it was a failure of the airplane. I have a few hours into TBM 700 and a few more on a 910, and I can tell you that it's probably the most amazing private single engine airplane in GA. It has excellent handling, and it is fast. It's, it's an amazing airplane. What it is not is aerobatic. The handling is so good that you might think it's a real performer, but it's not designed for aerobatic kind of a performance. To make the CG work, Sakota mounted that PT-6 way out there on the nose, and that's an issue here. Any airplane was going to drop the nose in an aileron roll. I flew the F-15E, and it had a roll rate in excess of 500 degrees a second, and the nose would still drop at least 5 degrees. The T-38 had an incredible roll rate, and in fact was limited to half stick for aileron rolls, because you can get into a roll couple PIO that could lease a lead to loss of control and in-flight breakup. Even the extra 300 high-performance aerobatic airplane will drop the nose. In that airplane, you use the rudder and pitch to keep the nose set. It happens fast. You've got to practice that. On one of my videos, a viewer noted, these are quotes, my first solo in T-34 over Perdido Bay, I tried to, an aileron roll, which was not an authorized maneuver, and I wound up, wound up pointing straight down, looking at, the wa at a water skiing family, it scared the crap out of me, end quote. Botched aerobatic maneuver could easily have resulted in TBM's nose falling 50 or 60 degrees or more. The T-34C is a turboprop mounted on a long nose, just like the TBM. With the high power setting, the airplane would accelerate like the proverbial bat out of hell, and the pilot would have been profoundly disoriented. And the nose, yeah. Regardless of whether the pilot did an intentional aileron roll or some other factor, resulted in the extreme nose low altitude, seconds count in an upset like this. There is no room for indecision. This was a nose low unusual altitude upset and quick correct action was required to survive it, period. Time is not on, their, on his side. So you gotta ask yourself, are you ready for a situation like the one faced by this pilot? My nickel on the grass here is to get upset prevention and recovery training as soon as possible. Be prepared and use your superior knowledge to avoid situations where you have to use your superior skill. That's my nickel. Well, I hope you liked the video. If you do, hit like and subscribe. It looks like and subscribe. It looks like this here. I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters also here. Without you guys making these videos, it would be harder to do. If you'd like to support the channel, I'll leave a link below to the Flywarm Patreon page, and I appreciate that. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flywarm.